Welcome to Playful Podcast, your guide into the underground scene where we discover topics on kink and electronic music every week. Don't forget to subscribe to not miss out on our next episode. I'm excited to be here today with house music producer, DJ, record label owner and public speaker Tare Tamlitz, also known as DJ Sprinkles, who started her record spinning journey in New York during the 80s. A red thread within Tare's work as an artist is the ongoing critique and pessimistic view on society's norms, such as capitalism, gender, sexuality and class, for example, something that also comes through within the music they're making. In this conversation, we speak about her approach to society at wide and teenage years feeling as an alien, how her approach to society at large took shape, her musical journey, of course, why house music is named that way, social media, and of course, so much more. I am super proud to present this episode to you. Let's get to it. I am Amanda and this is Playful Podcast. I'm excited to have you here. Okay. Yeah. You feel so uh, down to earth, like in the moment. Uh, well, I don't know. I'm a super materialist that's not into transcendental lofty things. So maybe that's part of it, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Do you feel that um, when you travel, that you have an easy time to adjust to the new environment or does it take your time to like ground or mm, well I really hate travel mm. and so I like during the COVID period it, the fact that like I wasn't able to do any work overseas and stuff was actually like super nice to the just best time of your yeah, life <laughs> yeah I wouldn't say go that far but yeah for for the sake of the interview drama yeah it was, it was the best time of my life <laughs> but um <laughs> Yeah, like I think it's really, um, I don't know, jet, also jet lag is a thing, you know, that's hard to deal with because I'm mm -hmm. coming from Japan and it's, if I'm in, usually in Europe or also to the US, it's even worse, like that gap. And so yeah. I don't know, it's a challenge, but so if I'm spaced out or something today, then you know why, it's just, okay. just jet lag. Yeah. So. I may be without jet lag, so that might also be <laughs> why I'm kind of down down to earth, and I'm just I'm just out of my sorts right now. All so. right, <laughs> okay. Um, if you would describe yourself using three words, what would they be? It has to be faith, family, and anti-abortion. No, could you imagine? <laughs> um, but in another way, I was, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, no, no. <laughs> She meant. Pro <laughs> trying to handle it. No, in my but own in another way, kind of these are also like if you think of like instead of like this whole kind of tendency to go to a question like that with something like looking for the empowering answer, it's really like maybe those are the things that from experience of youth and trauma and things that did inform who I am for sure, like in um, developing critical oppositions to those different. Yeah. things of faith family um, my father was also, like my father was a catholic cleric for 20 years before getting married and very staunch anti-abortion advocate oh, wow. and um yeah when i was a kid it was like because i was the artsy one so like in kind of you know fancy calligraphy I was, it was my job to make the big posters, you know, adoption, not abortion and all these sorts of thou shalt not kill big, this sort of bullshit. And, wow. um, yeah. And like going through that experience and, um, kind of, you know, going through the stages of learning and developing my own politics and my own responses and the ability to respond to and reject things that I didn't believe in. How did you do that? Like, how did you uh, confront that? Because just what you say, you learn by your peers or you like. Sure. Well, I think, you know, um, a lot of, a lo well, a lot of my experiences around those things were about um, ostracization and persecution. You could say harassment, maybe harassment is a better word. Or, um, And in, just in terms of like family and faith and that sort of thing, like, you know, being kind of um, always categorized as the fag, as the girl, as the whatever. And um, then, you know, so if you have antagonistic relationships within those frameworks and if you're always being positioned by the people around you as someone who's inherently a failure in relation to those systems, you either are going to um, 
totally destroy yourself in order to find a way to conform without ever, I think the, the odds of successfully conforming into those things is always going to be a nightmare struggle. Or you develop tools and just from witnessing and experiencing the hypocrisies of those moments to come up with, um, you know, alternate thoughts. Mm. And, and so, But what did your... Was it more so in school you were harassed or also at home? Everything, you know. Yeah, like I, yeah very... I think the experiences at home with the kinds of... Um, it was a very argumentative, aggressive kind of um, household. And then going to school where it was from a very early age. I mean, I wore really thick Coke bottle glasses since I was like an infant. So by the, so well before school started and things. And so my entire experience through school in the, this would be in the 1970s in the kind of Midwest America. Um, it was still at that time, that kind of world where, where, you know, having glasses was also a kind of weird stigma. And especially the if they're- thing or- Yeah, it's kind of, um, on the one, especially because they were very deforming glasses because I'm farsighted, which means that the glasses magnify mm. my eyes and face. And if I had these kind of big Coke bottle glasses that like would make... Like Steve Urkel. Yeah, yeah, basically. Mm. <laughs> and, um, and also, you know, there's a kind of gender component too with it, with the whole thing about like, you know, boys don't hit girls and boys with glasses and that sort of thing. So there were, and then I also had this kind of... Lucky you. Lucky me, yeah. <laughs> And yeah. well, but of course they totally do yeah, hit yeah, boys exactly. with glasses. Yeah, so I, that thing. actually makes you the target. <laughs> yeah. So um, try that theory out, you know? Mm. And um, so there were kind of a lot of things with that going on. Mm. And yeah. Huh. But it, it, what you're telling us now <laughs> makes me think that, that you're a person who stands up for yourself in some way, like with who what you or like how did you find your own uh, morals and your own politics or your like identity in this yeah. environment i mm, i there must be a very stubborn side to me that allowed that is something that i surely learned from the stubbornness of my father in particular but also my mother um that i think that this kind of moral entitlement that mm -hmm. they had was something that maybe allowed me to, or cultured, cultivated a kind of personality in myself as well, that um, in my kind of critical questioning of morality, kind of gave me the, um, this idea that even if I was in public, like being harassed and beaten up and kind of, and my thing was always pacifism. I never fought back and, and all that sort of thing. And of course, pacifism is totally out of vogue, <laughs> but um, I've always been pacifistic in that way. But at the same time, having a kind of weird stubbornness to just keep going, you know, despite that. And um, so even if I was beaten down one day, I'd show up the next day, still maybe dressing even more faggy or whatever, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I kind of go that direction rather than a kind of direct engagement in a kind of battle way or, or on their terms. It was more about, um, you know, well, if you want a fag, I'll show you a fag, you know, and just going more this other, uh, this other direction mm. that was really about allowing my body to create a, to interact with a situation that then would demonstrate the hypocrisies of a kind of rural American environment that claimed to be about freedom, claimed to be about free expression, claimed to be about all of these ideals that were things that I did in my youth quite believe in, but was also quite disappointed that the reality of the people in power around me, whether they were the adults, the clergy, the teachers, or if they were the, the children in my classes that held power within that kind of tribal spectrum, none of these people actually had any earnest commitment to the ideals that they felt they were defending by beating up a fag like me yeah. or something, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. and that hypocrisy was just yeah. obvious. So. Yeah. Did you have any like celebrities or some something that inspired you to dress in a fun or, you know, fun way and like not? I mean, part of it was that I, I grew up in a kind of um, 
like upper lower class, like we were the upper spectrum of lower class house, mm. lower income households. And so I just grew up with um, thrift clothes all the time, like since I was young. And, um, and also in within the family itself, I have, I'm one of four siblings. So I have an older brother, myself, a younger brother and a younger sister. And, but my younger brother was always much bigger than me. So in the chain of hand-me-downs, mm from like if my older brother got some new clothes, then it would go to my younger yeah. brother and then it would get to me. And so um, things like that were always, like I was always kind of living in this world of tattered clothes, you know? And that's something that I've kind of still, to this day is like, I'm super, it's really difficult for me to find new clothes that I like. Everything is always vintage or, you know, thrift shop, thrifted and stuff. Yeah. Um, how did I get onto this? What did you ask me? Oh, who knows? Let's just. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Apologies. I don't, I <laughs> no, but I'm the same. I just uh, am listening. That's the jet lag, right? That went off to the jet lag. <laughs> the... So. Thank you, jet lag. So <laughs> I love it. But okay, can you? Uh, uh, I. I have heard. Oh, you were asking me about like kind of like people who, in, in, yeah. So within that realm, though, then there were. Um, groups like like kind of electronic music people like um, Devo would be an American reference. Gary Newman, I was very into Gary Newman, um, Kraftwerk, things like this. And um, uh, it's really funny. Actually, Florian Schneider looks incredibly like my father when he was young. Like the like for example, like on the Man Machine album cover. And stuff. Did your dad know? No, 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 he he didn't make he didn't make the connection. No. But like really, like if you put the photos next to you, they're, they're very close. And um, that was also a kind of funny thing for me. But my father, of course, was really um, against my music selections, and he would often oh. confiscate my records and things like this. So. Okay, yeah. If we go back a little bit more, what I understand, both your parents really wanted you to play an instrument they're musical in some way or yeah they yes but in a in um non-professional ways like so my father was always very active in catholic chamber chorales and actually in the mid 70s he was his chamber chorale it was the saint paul chamber chorale um that they came to to europe for a little tour and he and so their group did that and then my mother was more of a folk musician. Actually, she was more like, as a child, she was kind of like an accordion protege. And then she got into folk music and um, things like that. And she, like, I live in Japan and she, uh, maybe about 15 years ago or so, a little more, she was part of a sister city exchange program where then she was part of a hammer dulcimer group that then came and performed folk music in Isasaki, Japan. And so they've kind of on that folk level and on the kind of um, hobbyist, like kind of dedicated hobbyist level. Mm. They were very into music in that way. Um, yeah, and so my father w really wanted, uh, he wanted all of us kids to play violin for some reason. This was like, the, I think because he played it as a child and it was kind of seen as the technical thing that was also, of course, from an economic side, must much more realistic than like a piano or something like this. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've told this story a million times, but like I, one of my earliest memories was they tried to get me into the Suzuki method for violin training at around two and a half. And at that time, this would have been like 1970, it was really big in kind of like pop child psychology in the US to get kids involved in everything at the age of two. So at the age of two, it's like I started snow skiing, ice skating, roller skating. Then there was this attempt to get me into the violin. And um, I just remember being put on a black pedestal box and I had like a mini violin, like holding it by the neck in one hand and holding the bow in the other and just screaming. Wow. And then the teacher, like, you know, because I, I was, I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was just a kid. Yeah. scared and the teacher was like okay maybe bring him back in you know when he's five so yeah from like five till 12 or so I played violin but I never practiced um, I practiced once into a tape recorder and then every time my parents would tell me to go practice I'd go to my bedroom and play this tape and 
So for these seven years, outsmarting everyone. I was, well, fuck it. And this is also my introduction into electronic music, right? But in a way, tape-based things. So anyway, but my, um, but in retrospect, I, I kind of feel sorry for my teacher because it was the same teacher through all the years of elementary school, and they just saw me never progress, never learn how to read music and all that stuff. <laughs> and they're like, slow. <laughs> Well, but um, in my view on this, it sounds like the the upper class to put your children in like, you know, a lot of like they need to learn Mandarin and uh, an instrument mm -hmm. and, you know, but um, what was my question? I have well, I think there is also this thing with the, the, the ways in which my father's involvement with the clergy and then um, for 20 years living as a teacher in these Catholic military oh. academies and stuff, it was very much about him being in, in a kind of academic environment. Oh, yeah. So, um, so that did actually then allow me to be exposed to a lot of kind of cultural things that perhaps other kids of the same economic spectrum their parents really didn't other than like sports you yeah. know it was more like the kids around me were like encouraged to do sports but not other kinds of cultural things really. yeah okay yeah what well, I, I remember now uh did your parents put a lot of pressure on you to be <laughs> oops are you good uh, i don't think so I, i think there's no orange juice it's a little on here you. but it's okay yeah that's um do you want yeah. what do you want no more? we keep going yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> did, did you always have to like uh, achieve or like did it put pressure on you with the grades and these things also or did you put your like that pressure on yourself well it it was an internalized pressure for sure and it was that kind of family where like they were pragmatic about what they insisted out of us so for example my my brothers were less academically inclined they were more you know they were quite big guys and I was like you know the little fragile one and so um their grades weren't so good so for example um they in America at that time it was a, a strange grading system I think it was like C S N were the ranks of like instead of A B C D E F or whatever but like if they let's say if out of a score of five if they were normally getting a three then if they got if they got a three, then they would get, you know, spanked for not having a, a four or whatever. And then for me, it's like if I was getting fives, but then if I got like a four in something, then it was like getting spanked for not getting the five. Or if I got fives, why wasn't I getting the five and a half for some weird advanced program? Or mm. So it was always this kind of weird Catholic thing of whatever you're doing, it's always... Not enough. Yeah, it's not enough. And it's always, you always have to be in a kind of state of penance and panic and yeah. that sort of thing so oh yeah and then let me know if i'm jumping too far now no no but then in the 80s you moved to new york in 86, 86 yeah, yeah i was 17 well i had just turned 18 like maybe three weeks three weeks earlier and i because i graduated high school at 17 and then moved i got myself into a university in New York with a scholarship and things like that so that I could just escape Missouri. Escape and Missouri. It's like a song. But yeah. <laughs> what did you I, study there? I studied painting, painting, you know, and it was like art. Yeah. And it was, this was also going against the family. This was like, you know, pursuing something that wouldn't turn into a career, pursuing something that wasn't meaningful or practical and blah blah mm. blah and and of course painting is yeah they were right in that sense that of course it's uh, completely uh bullshit and just as music <laughs> is but um you know like that that was a kind of it was a kind of typical queer migration story and it was also kind of like a typical thing that um you know as a kind of you know male kid who um wasn't good at sports or anything that of course then I'd be more like inclined to go into things that were kind of in the creative side you know in, in, writing or um, I was encouraged with writing or art or things like that but but this was also you know you kind of realize when you're older that um, well I certainly realized that 
the kind of encouragement I got that like of seeing that, oh yeah, you have a talent for drawing or you have a talent for this was actually really just like, um, people being kind to someone who really didn't have anything going on for themselves, you know? So it was just like, like, really? like I doubt to, it. Yeah, well, no, I for sure. Understand. I can feel that uh, when it comes to myself, but I, I think how I feel I doubt it. I think you are good. No, <laughs> if you like look at these drawings or things like that, then it's really like, oh yeah, this wasn't, this wasn't. I would love to look at it actually. Oh uh, no. Maybe you could send photo. <laughs> Okay, nothing you're proud of, obviously. <laughs> Certainly not. Well, I mean, pride. Is, who's pride of it? Who's proud of anything? Fuck pride. I mean, you know, that's, <laughs> pride is the least important thing. I oh, think. I'm gonna get to this topic so. soon. I'm so interested <laughs> in this too. Uh, like your view on on reality, or like pessimism. <laughs> but um, before that, you arrived in New York. How was that in the in '86 when the 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 city was the like the culture part of the city yeah. in my ID was booming in some way, but it was also it bad. was it was also though it was so it was right at this period when I moved there the the mayor was Ed Koch and then after him was Ru- Rudy Giuliani who's like the kind of weird crazy guy that was like Trump's lawyer and then after that uh, I was kind of there through that Trump Giuliani phase which was also the kind of key gentrifying stage in like the beginning of modern New York. Um, and which was very much also about, um, you know, it was a very police state aggressive thing. Like I lived on, I lived in a, in a real dump mouse infested apartment on Avenue B and sixth street. And that was right around the corner from Tompkins square park, where there was the infamous Tompkins square park riot where police were, um, this was under Giuliani, they were going to, you know, clear out homeless people and like all the cops removed their badges and um, so that they couldn't be identified and then just went crazy beating people up and like all the, just also not only the people within the park, but then also people coming by. And so it became a huge um, scandalous documented thing, the Tompkins Square riot. If people Mm. Google that or search that, they can find out about that. But like, that was like right around the corner. And that was, I remember that day I was just at home and I heard all these helicopters and outside and it was like, and I went out to see what was going on. And it was like, yeah, they were all police helicopters. And then these cops everywhere, just beating the shit out of people. And I just saw this person, completely unrelated person to anything on a bicycle coming down this cop ran up and stuck their baton into the front tire and made their but it was really this level of um violence and absurdity happening that led to the contemporary new york and this is why it's like when you go to new york today and then people and you and people are like oh yeah but you know it's so safe now and it's it was worth it and so so that's like it was such, such a heartless thing. Like if we're you know, not like, smarter than that, we cannot ugh. like try to be smarter than that. Even the majority of people really don't give a fuck. They really don't. They're as only, long as it's not them who are targets. Are comfortable, yeah. As long as they are comfortable, they don't give a fuck. Mm. And but they're also the ones who are like so tightly holding to morality. Yeah. And that's also a continuity with my childhood. I would say. Yeah. yeah. Right. And. Uh, and the ladder, the hierarchy. Yeah. Hierarchy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, who were you back then? Were you like going out to parties? You know, what, what, how was yeah. your lifestyle? Well, I mean, so I grew up in a very kind of antisocial, geek, freaky, faggy, whatever, who knows, kind of gender fuck and stuff. And um, then in un- my university years, yeah, I was kind of, um, I got quite into reading um, materialist and Marxist kind of manifestos and things. Um, and in relation to the visual arts and things, um, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of constructivist manifestos and also like um, the George Groats, uh, Der Kunstlump or the Art Scab, things like, and also Art is in Danger, documents like these that were really like from more than a hundred years ago now that thoroughly analyzed and critiqued in very good ways, the interesting ways, um, the gallery and museums, economies and scenes. And 
there I was, you know, 70 years later, 80 years later than they had been written. And it was still completely business as usual. Yet the people in those economies understood and had studied and read those texts. And it was still just business as usual. And that's what really killed my interest in the arts is the way that all of these critiques, everybody was aware of them, but they just also completely kept marketing off it. And also, um, so for example, like, the example, the easiest example to make this clear is like someone like Andy Warhol, who who built a career around the idea of um, critiquing originality and authenticity by printing, for example, corporate logos, um, photographs and articles taken from newspapers, things like that. It was very much a rejection of what, what the existentialists and things were doing that were into demonstrating a exercise and exercising a pure self into the canvas or this sort of thing. He was very much rejecting that and critiquing those notions of creativity Mm -hmm. and also doing things that kind of go into the realm of, in music, what you could say is like sampling culture. You know, he was taking these signs and things and preprinted. But today, the Warhol, you know, the thing I always point out is that the Warhol Foundation will sue you for replicating a Warhol print that's a print <laughs> of an unauthorized <laughs> use of a logo or the something else. You know? Yeah, so that, is, that sums up my hatred of the arts. Yeah, it's like, I want to make money on this, but you shouldn't. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it all, so it's all, and it's just a refusal to address the hypocrisies in one's mm. own process, right? Again, it ties into a kind of weird morality and this kind of preserving the authenticity of Warhol and all this sort of bullshit. So yeah. that sort of stuff really turned me off at an early age to the visual arts. And then at the same time, I was kind of in parallel um, as a hobbyist. I was starting to DJ and things like that. And um, and of course, music is an even more difficult social space to discuss these kinds of critiques because um, in part, I think there's a class issue at play because music functions much more for most people, it functions much more on a populist level, whereas art is more a little bit hot couture, you know what I mean? Mm. Like it has that classism to it. Um, but for example, you know, people in the arts who were completely familiar with these critiques of authenticity could at the same time not transplant that into music and still be completely seduced by the authenticity of the blues musician or something like this, right? So this, this also meant To me, like what I saw, how I saw this was that music was an even more difficult space to have these discussions and which I think holds true today. And in a way, my entire career has been about performing those failed critiques in the arts within the audio marketplace, not to try and get them to work, but actually to just re-demonstrate that they're inherently going to fail. And that, this is, again, my pessimism and my nihilism. So it's just been about performing the failure of those critiques in the art sphere, within the music sphere, and just as a kind of, um, yeah, kind of death train demonstration of you know, yeah. <laughs> the impossibility for, for these things to take hold. And, yeah. You mentioned that you were starting to DJ around this time. Yeah. But... Correct me if I'm wrong, but your first gig was somewhere in Asia. No, it was at a club called, it was a place called Club 59 that was kind of like a a gay Asian fetish club. And it was, and it was because um, my partner at the time was one of the founding members of the Asian Pacific Islander Caucus of ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. So ACT UP is like a um, really important activist group that also they had um, contingents here in Berlin is in, in Frankfurt and stuff that ba- basically in the late eighties were doing, um, a lot of demonstrations and political work around, um, uh, issues of HIV and AIDS and uh. this sort of thing. And there, so the, and the main contingent, what was called the main floor of these meetings was pretty much dominated by white gay men and the politics were also pretty much white gay male politics. So then, Mm. but at the same time, you know, there were different issues, for example, like how, how HIV was being studied and, or not being studied and things for women and things like this and how the, um, also different issues for people of color and things like that. So there became all these kind of side contingents that were, that were organized. And one of them was the Asian Pacific Pacific Islander caucus. Mm -hmm. 
that I mentioned my partner at the time was part of. And I was also like a ghostwriter for them and stuff like that. And for your partner for the for, for the for the caucus. Uh-huh. And um, okay, for the their like their books. For their uh, educational outreach materials yeah. and things like that. Yeah. And then so then I ended up they ended up using one of my tapes, mixed tapes in their gay pride parade contingent. And then also then when they organized a um, uh, benefit at Club 59, then I also DJed at that. And as a result of that, I got a couple gigs on my own at Club 59 after that, but it really didn't they fucking hated it, the music I was playing, because I was playing really underground, instrumental, New Jersey, Louis Saida, Deep House, and everybody wanted Whitney and all this <laughs> stuff. So um, Whitney Houston for the youngsters. And, um, and so then from that, I just kind of went around with a tape to some different... I, I was kind of... Most of the clubs that I would go to were this kind of New York midtown scene that was very tragic and very much about um it was not the cool clubs that people remember you know uh, yeah. so um not studio 59 not studio 59 <laughs> not the not the loft you know i mean the loft would play my music but they wouldn't let me in or that sort of thing you know? really so, yeah yeah so. but they didn't know who you were or they were like ah oh, this person is too annoying kind of no no they didn't know who i was and they didn't and so it's like and you know i just like i mean i'd show up at the door looking like a young young version of this or whatever and then they just be like oh, get go away <laughs> like, yeah well, you need to look you know. fashion i mean obviously i'm one of these people that like could never get into Berghain if i tried or something, really you know? i mean don't you think i mean I, oh I, I am so bad at uh reading these things yeah, like me i don't too. understand I have no, it really yeah so my upbringing is a kind of anti-social no friends kind of person of course then i didn't go to new york and suddenly have all these friends i was I was in the DJ booth. If I did go to the club, you know what I mean? Like I was away from the people. I, so that was kind of more my experience with the club scene there. I, I mean, I did enjoy going dancing a few times in my early years. I had some friends that brought me. And at that time, the big clubs were that I enjoyed were Madame Rose's and 1018, which are kind of both two places that have been lost to history. But um, mm. we used to, I mean, it was a great moment because house music hadn't quite coalesced into a marketable genre yet so it was because the origin of the term house music for a lot of people kind of forget is that it's it's not a genre of music it's actually refers to the fact that in the old days DJs didn't bring records to the clubs the clubs had their own in-house collections so the house music was the music of the house or of the venue and each house each venue had their own collection of records and that collection also had its own kind of sound so that's why like the paradise garage of course their collection was the sound of garage house right or like the loft their collection was the sound of what became like loft house or so the associations that people have with those are actually yeah like the the kind of genres and mood of a club and within that there'd be all different genres of music going from soul to disco to um you know, more electronic club music and whatever, you know, like, so, so that's kind of, in that stage, I remember it was like 1986. And the first time I went to, um, it must've been 1018 and they played LL Cool J's Rock the Bells. And then that was followed by Joyce Sims. Um, oh, what was this? There was a big Joyce Sims song at the time. And then that was followed by um, Don't Let It Be Crack. And then that was followed by um, uh, uh, Jack Your Body. And so these kinds of different songs going on. And it was re- like, it was a mix, you know, like in New York also had this real strong mix of hip hop and house culture, Todd Terry doing music that was really sample based dance stuff that really crossed between house and uh, hip hop. And, you know, then that, and then there was that weird, awkward hip house phase, you know, and, um, mm. So interesting, but if I, if I um so the the first year everyone hated you, but <clears throat> in my understanding also now that you play, you don't care about if anyone hates it. Well, you know, I like, never I never did because well yeah. because by the time I was already um, you know a late teenager going to New York, I had already had enough experiences with 
understanding that no matter what I do to try and appease people, it's going to fail. That was my kind of lived experience. So, you know, when it came to DJing, I, I just from the start, I, and also because I knew my music tastes were, uh, at least within my friend circles, peculiar, you know, or not, not even popular among the people that I got along with. So then the idea of me playing things for strangers and that they would be into it, this was also kind of not necessarily part of my um, formula for getting through the night, you know. And then at that time, my first, when I got my first residency as a DJ, at, that would be at Sally's 2. This was probably about six months after the uh, Club 59 stuff. Um, or maybe a year. But then that was like three nights a week from... 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. So like six hour sets, three nights a week. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was bringing my own record. Basically, they hired me because I was, bring, I was bringing my own records in. So that was kind of right at that moment when mm -hmm. house music was changing to the DJs bringing in their music. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I had like these milk crates filled with records that then I'd leave in their kind of restaurant back room. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And Were you already a <clears throat> DJ Sprinkles at this time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, was that early on? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was always DJ Sprinkles. So Yeah, how yeah. did that come to you? Um, well, at the time DJ names were quite macho and I wanted something that was completely faggy and stupid. And um and at the time down the street from me, like around the corner from that um kind of slum that I lived in, in on six and B, um, Annie Sprinkle was doing some of her kind of porn kind of post-porn industry, kind of um, perform feminist performance art, kind of like uh, her, her, she was doing those kinds of events, like at a um, venue around the corner. I think it was PS1 was the name of the venue. And, but it was all like super tragic, but also kind of, I was like, oh, but it's, you know, it's like kind of sex industry stuff and kind of like, yeah, women, uh, women's sex industry stuff. And then also then, um, And of course, like Sprinkle is a reference to golden showers, right? Being peed on. Right? Oh, so, so Annie fun. Sprinkles. So, so yeah. then there was a TV commercial for mm -hmm. like maybe like a Pillsbury cake recipe thing, oh. like a kit to make cakes. And it had a voiceover that was, it was for like, you know, it came with like the cake mix and the frosting and then these candy sprinkles. And it was like with sprinkles in the mix. And I was like, oh, that's such a stupid gay kind of dj shout out right sprinkles in the mix and so i was like oh okay. yeah so with annie sprinkle around the corner and then <laughs> so many stupid, times <laughs> yeah i was just like okay i gotta it's a stupid stupid name so that'll that'll be and yeah and here i am like what 30 okay. some years later and exactly still, and you fuck me like <laughs> in some ro rooms you're a total legend <laughs> and you got to that point without ever having a phone i don't have a cell phone that's true <laughs> yeah how, how do you manage i've just never had one so i've <laughs> I've, i've never needed one I, no. i don't i yeah i i just never made that leap you know and it was it was originally just an economic thing you know like i could i needed to have a landline for like fax and internet and stuff back in the 90s and 2000s And I couldn't afford to have a landline and a cell phone. Mm. And I also felt that like everybody who had a cell phone around me ended up getting suckered into some 300 euro mistake bill and stuff. And I was just like, oh, I don't want to deal with that. Mm. So it was just kind of, I just never got into it. And then I never needed it. And yeah, yeah you just, you just. Like when I came here today, you just make plans. And then, you know, when I left my hotel room after that point, I was offline yeah. and you just, you just meet people where you tell them you're going to meet. And that's the way we did it. Yeah. You know? But at some point you didn't have email either. Or... Well, no, I pretty much had email. Okay. Yeah. But I don't have Wi-Fi out of the house, you know, like it's basically when I'm at home, I have an internet connection. Oh, you do? Yeah. Yeah. And I have a landline yeah. because it's Ooh. combined with the internet connection in terms of how they set it up in japan mm -hmm. but um yeah but then when i leave the house i'm i'm offline yeah and you obviously don't have social media and these things no i never did social media no but it's a big topic also like uh, in the in the electronic music scene or like techno scene and these things that yeah. 
that people speak about like the pressure of being online and that some even in all like industries that it's a it can be a, like I, I guess like at least all music that the managers can pressure you to be on TikTok or these things. Yeah. And like, if you want to grow, <clears throat> you need it. Like, what's your view on, on the being present and showing up? For- you know, yeah, it was very strange. I remember this moment. It must have been maybe around 2012 or so when suddenly in like overnight, it was like, yeah, when people would invite you to basically up before that time, it's like if people wanted you to come to, perform for them they'd reach out the organizers would reach out you'd make plans and that would be it and then suddenly overnight it became this thing of yeah this kind of panic where like you have to have social media and then the organizers being like well so you you know as part of the contract you have to advertise on your on this platform that platform whatever and all these accounts and I was just like I was just like well I don't do that and then they and you know, I think what people don't realize is that it's okay to tell people you don't do something if you you don't have to do it. And and if they say, well, if you don't do it, then we won't hire you. You can also just say, okay. And then at some point they'll come back. That's what people don't realize. You know, Ooh, it's the game. It's it's they are fucking players. They are, and playing. you can either you know you can either be a pawn. Or you can just walk away from the fucking game and then just like, you know, if, if they if they want to come back, they'll come back. Same with fees. Don't do things for free. If you ask for a fee and they can't afford it, that's it makes complete sense if people's budgets don't align. There's no insult in that. It doesn't have to be like, for example, if you ask for a fee and they refuse, it doesn't have to be about them being assholes. Exactly. And in the same way, it's like if you ask for a fee, it doesn't have to be about you being an asshole even though that's the way you're going to be led to feel a lot of the time. But yeah, just, you know, if you tell people what your terms are and if you are just willing to, if they see that you actually, yeah, these are your actual real terms. If I can't meet, the, if I can't match that fee, then they will turn down this job, but it doesn't mean they're telling me to fuck off. You know, I think organizers will realize that. And then when they have something that will suit you, then they'll come back and ask you if you're interested, you know, and I think people just have to, think about those things and allow themselves mm-hmm. to disconnect from the parts of the of that game or whatever that that don't feel comfortable for them because mm. otherwise it does all those things will consume your practice and that will also dictate how you produce and distribute and everything and that's why I can understand why young younger people today feel that if they don't participate in those things what else are they going to do because mm-hmm. they've literally subscribe to the notion that these are the only things left in mm-hmm. the world and unless you step out of those things of course you're not going to have experiences that that then generate different practices you know so if you're if you feel if you really believe in the depths of your heart that the only ways for you to function in some sort of field is to go along with the mainstream, then everything you do is going to be compromised by mainstream politics. Even mm. if you p- attempt to define yourself as outside or culturally minor or underground or whatever, mm. if you're, if the contracts you're dealing with, if the practices you're dealing with, everything coincides with the mainstream shit, yeah. then, then, I mean, come on, wake up. Yeah. It's, it's the thing of, I think the feeling that so many of us have like not being enough or not you know not being what anyone wants you know Mm. and so it has it's so much internal work also too and I think but I think only for people to hear you saying this you know makes also people be like "Ah," you know Mm. because it doesn't occur to anyone that you can change the rules when some people from the who are yeah. felt as if they are above you set rules, well, you might not be able to change almost. them. You might not, but it might mean stepping out of the systems that those rules apply. Yeah, you know. Mm. And I think if people spent less time working on their um, working on their you know image and identities, and they just spent more time working on their work, they would they would at least be generating different things. It doesn't mean it would lead to a kind of um, recognizable success or whatever but it would but I think that it would you know if people focused on their work more than focused on cultivating their persona 
<laughs> it would, you know, you'd end up with more interesting discourse happening around these things, you know, so. Yeah. Especially when it comes to like queer stuff, you know, I think this is like kind of part of the trap of how we f fall so deeply into identity politics and this kind of overwhelming, you know, algorithmic saturation of the idea that queer issues are identity issues and not actually material political issues. What? Now I'm not following. I feel a little slow. But... That like, so an identity issue would be like, for example, the ways in which like um, all of all of the issues around sexuality and queerness and gender and stuff are kind of positioned as ultimately rooted in individual choice rather uh -huh. than it being a relational Aye. situation that is social, grounded in a social uh, material mm. interaction um, that, you know, like this, of course, coincides with the whole online culture idea that, you know, that, that, you know, what gets re rewarded in a mm. kind of dominant cultural level or in an algorithmic level are things that do comply to the, to the notion that it's all about performing an identity, performing a personality, performing a persona and performing a self you know, rather than actually, because what could be from the dominant power structure side, what could be more removed from an actual engagement in social political process yeah. than someone who's just only able to like focus on their own feelings? You know what I mean? <laughs> so this is all it slows, more than coincidence. Yeah. You know? And it slows the progress down. If you think about it, like what you just said, you know, to, to figure out what you actually, who you actually are without what actually works or like what's okay. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, I actually read someone on a forum named that. Mm -hmm. So this guy on Reddit claimed to know that you hate DJing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah? Sure. <laughs> sure. So it's... Um... Well, I mean, I just like performance of any kind. I consider mm. my work to be non-performative in, in its construction. Yeah. But um, the, the fact that it must be performed in order to economically survive means that I'm always in this constant state of, um, you know, of course, like economic compromise and kind of also a kind of hypocritical mm. state of like, you know, living off of performance while while being disinterested in the kind of social structures around performance. I mean, that's mm -hmm. why I got into electronic music because it was a, there were, there are aspects to it that are a rejection of the rock stage and also a rejection of the classical musicology stage and all those sorts of things. And I'm, I'm interested in a critique of those stages, rejecting them. Mm. It was also like part of my interest in, in drag, you know, on, uh, as drag is something that is, that uh, is at its core about parody and about, um, inauthenticity, you know, the lip sync, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's the fake. And this is also something that I think has gotten really lost and convoluted in, um, in time within like the kind of pride based LGBT scenes and stuff where mm. it, where, you know, most discussions about drag culture and all stuff is all about authenticity, just like DJ discussions about DJ culture are also about authenticity. Whereas the thing, the very things that drew me to those were the fact that these were spaces that allowed for um, fallacy and that allowed for kind of hypocrisy and betrayal and like a kind of act, like a seeing culture be actually generated out of practices of hypocrisy mm. openly. But that openness, again, has kind of in its marketability, through its marketability in music and the arts and that sort of thing, we've seen how drag culture has been commodified and popularized to a point where um, where it's all about authenticity and this mm. again has penetrated uh, LGBT politics and transgendered politics in particular where it becomes all about um, all the discussions are essentialist transsexual dominated you know uh, you know stories of authenticity and the journey whereas I'm really interested in unbecoming that process of unbecoming Mm. much more than arrival or the journey you know it's for me like divestments of power and deconstruction and dismantling are much more interesting to me than yeah. than construction and arrival yeah so i love hearing this it makes me feel inspired to hear all this because yeah no, don't be inspired but no <laughs> it's gonna go away soon don't yeah, worry yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> it's Momentary not gonna last laughs, forever yeah, so. 
We have now come to the part of the podcast where if you are or want to become a Patreon and support our work and what we do, as well as get more juicy material, go to patreon.com slash playful magazine, where we speak to DG Sprinkles about their approach to creative blocks, as well as pessimism and how that shapes their productions. We also speak about how she works through topics they're interested in and use that as a creative outlet to delve deeper into the subject and so much more. This is something else and you don't want to miss it. Go to patreon.com slash playful magazine. I really want to know how come you moved to Japan. Like it's the furthest you can go from your family. <laughs> that, I mean, at, a, at its core, end of discussion. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but do you like it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, Japan is a very difficult place. It's, you know, notoriously misogynistic and things like this too. It's not in any way a haven. I don't have any kind of I never had any sort of fetishistic uh idealization of the culture there. Um I think people everywhere are shit. And, you know, starting with my own culture and place and then every place uh, people are just we're just shitty things right so i don't have it was so it was never a kind of fantasy migration thing you know but um but at the time i had a partner that i was able to move to japan through and um also i had some uh i have a record label since 1993 i've had a record label called comatones and that label only had distribution in japan at the time And so I never, so I was living in the U.S., never had any work there. I sometimes had performance work in Europe. This was before the Europeans learned about house music and DJ sprinkles and stuff. So it was as Terry Tamlitz, the electroacoustic stuff. And then in Japan, I had my house music being distributed there. So I thought, well, if I move to Japan, at least I'll possibly have a kind of economic base as well, which could have helped. And also, of course, I was miserable in the U.S. And, you know, so I, um, again, not aspiring to the idea that Japan would necessarily work. But I thought, oh, I'll, I'll try this, you know, and also for the relationship and stuff. But it, like, yeah, it was a classic thing where like six months later, you know, they were totally not talking to me anymore. And so, you know, I was bankrupted by moving everything. So, But so, somehow it worked out. It's going on 23 years now. Okay. And so. And how, who are you? This is a. Who are you in a position when your life falls apart? Like how? Because it's for for me just you know you have this. Uh, but that's the very, norm, right? So yeah, what but, is? Are you suggesting that that is a kind of? No, yeah, I'm just thinking. There are moments where things aren't falling apart. Or? <laughs> exactly. This is what <laughs> this is what I think is interesting because you have this view that the society is don't wanna compromise. To share with you, they want you to stay positive. They want you to fight to to like become something. Mm -hmm. And when things are not working upwards, you need to feel like a failure mm -hmm. because that's how they think you're gonna yeah. do like yeah, yeah live. So yeah, so if you compare yourself to feeling as a failure when your the society means that you have fallen down, do you think that? Uh, how do you see it? Do you see it like? And you just, it's like not an, a special day. <laughs> it's certainly not a special day. It also, but to say that doesn't mean that I have a kind of cavalier comfort with failure. Of course, it still affects me in, you know, I still like it's, I, um, you know, I think I'm capable of putting on a kind of social facade in public, but of course, like uh, these things, yeah, I'm, I'm a kind of weird, depressed, sad person, you know, basically <laughs> when it comes down to it. But um The, I think that um, this is maybe part of the why living in Japan did work for me. I, well, one big factor is that I work at home, so I'm not forced to engage on a regular basis with the kind of um, uh, workforce culture there, which is incredibly brutal, slave-driven kind of, you know, no workers' oh, rights yeah. and no mm. vacation. And, Or you, you get vacation, but you're not allowed to take it kind of world, yeah. um, which is also increasingly the norm in the West. But um, so I'm kind of left to my own devices in a way on a daily living thing. And also in Japan, just because of physically the minute people see me, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm other. And so that also gives me psychologically an immediate framework to kind of 
be a little bit more relaxed about the fact that um, uh, the yeah. fact that I exist as an outsider, because in the U.S., where um, in the U.S., it was much more psychologically registering as like my own personal individual failure was behind or my own problems were the core thing behind my inability to kind of get along with those around me and to be an outsider. And this isn't to say like, of course, of course I have my, I'm, of course I'm an asshole. Of course I'm a fucked up person that d- does things that can keep people at a mm. distance. I'm not trying no, to portray it otherwise, but, but you know, like there's a difference between being in an environment where you internalize all of those things mm. 100% and kind of just really, um, and then being in an environment where you kind of have this moment where you say like, ah, you know, of course I have these fucked up things about me, but you know what? Like a lot of it was America. A lot of it was what was going on around mm. me. And that kind of feeling a bit validated in the things that I kind of knew, but also what didn't allow myself to truly trust mm. in my experience and understanding and accepting that yeah, beyond myself, they're really, of course, in my critique and dislike of the world around me when I lived in America. Yeah, just having it validated a bit. Yeah. That, yeah. Okay. Last question before the extra material. Okay. Um, so now you are in Berlin and you have yeah. been here a zillion times, I guess. What are, what's your view on the city? Like, what do you like about it? And what do you not like about it? I, I don't think I could live here. I think there would be too much pressure to kind of be a productive producer or whatever the hell, You're you know what I mean? The, well, not so much, but, um, <laughs> but I mean, but, the, but I mean, you know, it seems like you, I would end up being trapped in social circles where there would be continual demand to talk about and think about and be making things. And I, I don't like to do that. Like when, like my normal socializing is with like, I don't, my friends and loved ones are not people who are involved in these sorts of activities. You know what I mean? Like I'm not, I don't particularly like artists or musicians or curators or, or, or organize. I, I'm not interested in it really. Yeah. As, and so I think it would be very difficult for me to live here. But um, mm. at the same time, of course, I've had a, for multiple decades, I've, I mean, my very first international show was at the Volkspuna in 1997. And I was doing, um, a performance of uh, Di Robert Rubato, which is my piano solos of Kraftwerk. And um, so they brought me into the Volksbühne and it was on the Pfingst weekend. And so everybody was out of town and I was in Berlin's oldest and biggest rotating stage with about 20 people in the audience, Whoa. maybe 23. Oh. And, um, <laughs> Lucky ones. And, <laughs> um, yeah. And so then like, and so it was very, you know, like, I mean, so again, it's like this kind of, uh, very funny absurdity, but starting then, and then in, I, and I also had a very personal connection here because my, one of my best friends, Brent Lennartz, who was the early A&R person for Mill Plateau Records, he also lived here for a long time. And, Whenever I came to Berlin, it meant I got to stay with him for a couple of weeks. And um, so I have really wonderful personal memories. But um, yeah, I've never actually, of course, I have business relationships with certain venues and things like that, but and curators and things. But um, I've never, I've never actually been interested in trying to think of it as a home or whatever, you know, I do think it is um, less open than people like to believe it is. Mm. I think that, you know, my experiences in drag here have, have included antagonistic experiences that people would kind of disavow happening. Um, and I know that's the case for others too. I remember I was part of an exhibition called Intersex 101. That was, this was a long time ago. It must maybe in the early two thousands or something. And, but there were, um, many of the participants, we were coming from different areas by train and bus and stuff. And one had a knife pulled on them, uh, in the subway. I was, you know, I've been harassed in the streets many times and stuff too. And it's norm to, you know, it's normal we can say, but I think when the people, when you discuss these things, the reaction of Berliners is like, no, no, that doesn't happen. And so I think there's a perception. They don't want to accept. They don't it. want it to. Ha- they really don't want it to happen. And and they, I think they take it quite personally mm-hmm. when 
the suggestion that it does. Mm -hmm. But um, there's still, yeah, there's still a lot of challenges out in the city. And I think it's okay for people to speak openly about it. And yes, not we in, must. Yeah. We must. And it doesn't have to be in a framework of victimization or whatever. It can just be about um, wishing to address a situation that through dialogue and education and I believe kind of nonviolent forms can be maybe um, we can find ways to protect ourselves but yeah um, but again I'm kind of hopeless on these things my, my standard my default position is that these antagonisms will always exist mm. in relation that is if you are involved in any kind of deviation from heteronormative culture these days it's no longer really meaningful to say to speak of deviation from let's say like heterosexuality or from um you know standard binary gender because of course within the mainstream these things have become quite uninter they're not so challenging people really don't care who you fuck or how you identify as long as your lifestyle is ultimately heteronormative if you have a commitment to employment to family to children to uh blah 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 in, and owning a house and da da da. Providing. That, yeah. So it really is these days. I think the more productive target for analysis is not so much gender and sexuality themselves, or or being in a position of gender and sexual variance, but actually about one's relationship to heteronormativity, and that kind of becomes the um, maybe possibly a more productive starting point to analyses of what is actually happening in this moment, you know, and, mm. and this is again, getting away from the kind of social media algorithmic suggested dependency on identities and, so, and that, that our identity is what is what's really going to empower us, but actually thinking about how even those identities that historically we've traditionally come to see, to think of as, alternative or somehow challenging yeah. to the norm have actually been quite elegantly incorporated into the heteronormative. And then that means that we have to re-strategize and rethink yes. about how to... Fool the mind a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> U-turn. <laughs> Maybe just stop fooling ourselves so much. You True. Know. But, yeah. But I think we fool the fuck out of ourselves. Yeah. You know. I think we feel comfy that way, right? Yeah, comfort. If you feel comfortable, something's going wrong. You know? And, the... and the last person anybody should trust is themselves. <laughs> yes, I stand by that. I really do. It's either this or it's that. This is this or that. Introvert or extrovert? Uh, introvert. Introvert. Yeah. Hip hop or heavy? But this doesn't mean. But then again, these are loaded. Like this is like your first question about like, can you summarize yourself in three words? This yeah. is such a kind of um, impossible thing for people. It's like such an unfair question, you know. <laughs> it is unfair. It is so unfair. That's why you can say none. And 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 because also because you don't know how somebody's what they're. We know that the dominant association with introvert is someone who's silent or something but this is also there's a lot of introversion Nuances. that can be yeah there's, yeah 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 some people are like i'm an introvert extrovert or i'm an extroverted yeah. introvert or but i would say since my tendency is to withdraw then then i'm saying introvert okay okay, okay. a hip-hop or heavy metal fucking hip-hop for sure yeah yeah old school though okay can you like give basically us anything name? from anything from the 70s up through crucial conflict the co crucial conflicts first album, then within that range. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, New York or Tokyo? Oh, fuck. Neither. Me neither. Oh yeah. Uh, well, this one is obvious, and we're gonna speak more about it soon. But pessimism or optimism? For sure, pessimist. For sure. Yeah. Uh, performing live or being in the studio? Studio for sure. Yeah. Uh, Madonna or Whitney Houston? Oh God, neither. Neither. Uh, train or airplane? Train. Yeah, do you like trains? I don't like either, but I certainly will choose train over airplane. Yeah? Yeah. You don't think it can be cozy? I think 
I, I have problems with the pressure shifts in airplanes yeah, and the too. kind of um, swelling of the body that happens uh, afterward. And so I don't I, know if it swells, but it feels yucky. I, yeah, I have. I always end up with sinus infections and things after. What is it? Ah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Swelling of. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ugh. But now you're fine after traveling for so long. No? Well, I'm doing my best not to be sniffing because I know if I <laughs> sniff on camera, everybody assumes I'm a cokehead. But it's ah. actually like. Really? Yeah, like I want, I, you know. Ah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. A lot of mm. people sniff though, without being that, I guess. But who am I to know? Of course, we sniff without doing that. But it's like, <laughs> but it's like, but I, you know, it's just like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to be that. <laughs> but okay. it's funny that these okay. are the things we, thirty years in the business, has you thinking about. Yeah, but speaking of that, high on life or whatever comes your way along the night. Neither. No. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> cooking at home or delivery food? Cooking at home. Yeah, and you yeah. like to cook? Yeah, yeah. I like what to do cook. you do you have any specific specific dish? You do? Yeah, I, I mean like I'm the sibling in my family that still holds on to all of my grandmother's old recipes, both of my grandmother's recipes and has the and old cookbooks from a hundred years ago and things. And but your grandma was Italian, one so of them or the German so my father's side is German or yeah. Pomer Pomeranian German and also South German. And then my mother's side is North Italian, and so, but they were both they were both born in the U.S. So you know, it's like ah, so it's a different thing in the U.S., right? Yeah. Because people think, oh, white people from the U.S. and they must be British or French, but no, it's like so. I'm from the German Italian kind of. So the cooking is mostly American recipes. It's German influenced American, I would say. All right. So no Napolitana pizza. Not so much pizza, but no. the, but pasta and things. But again, it's like you know, like so. My mother's my mother grew up in in the kind of when she was very young. They were in the Italian ghetto, and then they made the economic bump up to a Jewish ghetto, and then that was like her. So then her she actually learned her and her mother. Their their fa the my now the current family recipe I have for spaghetti sauce they are the Italian. The Italian family spaghetti sauce actually came from a Jewish woman. In that, mm -hmm. th that so, it's all it's all yeah. yeah. And that way, it's American mixed up. But yeah, but, okay. Yeah. But the German side is much more kind of yeah, like using egg noodles and making uh, things Ugh. like that. So yeah, okay. Drag um, show or lights show? Drag. Yeah. Lights are the worst, aren't they? Like, how can it be 2023 and it's still like these really ugly colored lasers and shit? It's like club lights are the worst. Yeah, they can be. They can. Ugh. They need to be really darn good for me to enjoy it. Like sometimes I'm like, ah, I'm not epileptic, but ah. Yeah, it's just really not my palette. No. The, the, the visual, the colors themselves are mm. really not my palette. You know? Yeah. Like I, I have no interest in these colors. No. Like bright green and red and blue. And it's like, oh, it's like. No, no. Oh. What's your favorite color though? <laughs> uh, maybe green or red. Or I love blue green. Or, no, I'm, that was yeah? a joke. And that was a follow up. But, um, that was a callback. <laughs> that was completely a serious. I really love green. Kind but of yeah. brown. Brown? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm happy you answered it. Otherwise, I would feel very stupid. Yeah. No, since I was a kid, I'd say brown. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Game of Thrones or Twin Peaks? Uh, again, kind of neither. But uh, uh, I didn't like Twin Peaks, but you know, I kind of I I really like Blue Velvet. I haven't seen. Oh, that's like the best of. I mean, basically, when it comes to um, uh, to um, oh my god, how can I be blanking out on his name? Listen. David Lynch, for oh, David fuck's Lynch, sake! Yeah. Fuck. Um, um, yeah, like. Um, Basically, like the Elephant Man and Blue Velvet are the two that you gotta see. Uh huh. Yeah. The other ones for me are a little too. Did I watch it? But... No. Yeah. No. Okay. Good tip. Uh, bros or cats? What are cats? Bros or cats? Bros. Bros. <laughs> bros, like hey, bro. Yeah. No, well, like bro, like a bro is like a dude. Yeah. A very broy dude. Well, fucking cats. Yeah, you like cats? Yeah, what the fuck? Of course, cats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could imagine you being a, a cat person. Actually. I love cats. Yeah, do you have Yeah, I mean, my studio name was Meow. For oh, all these years, really? Which is like the English, American English for what sound that a cat makes. 
I don't know what cats say in German, but do you have cats? I don't right now. No, but I did yeah. in New York. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, ramen or fries? Ramen or rice? Fries. Ramen or fries? Ramen or fries? Yeah. I'll go with fries. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And last one. Night walks by yourself or morning meditations? Uh, I don't, I'm not into meditation, no. so we'll say night walks. Do you do them? Um, I like to walk. I don't do it so much at night. Yeah. But, yeah. No, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> This was it for Playful Podcast this week, but please follow, subscribe and listen to our next episode. And if you want to have a say about future artists or even ask your own question to one of our guests, follow us on Instagram and make sure to add your question when we lift our coming guests. Thank you so much for joining and see you next week.